When it opened in August last year, the Opal Tower in Sydney was spruiked as a marvel of construction, a state-of-the-art residential skyscraper. Owners who'd spent millions on the 392 apartments were thrilled with their purchases. But on Christmas Eve, everything changed. Dangerous cracks appeared in the four-month-old building. Panicked residents were evacuated as headlines screamed it might topple at any moment. Then the blame game started. Tonight, the Nine Network's finance editor, Ross Greenwood, reports what went wrong with the Opal Tower and how the consequences of this building catastrophe affect us all. The Opal Tower in Sydney's Olympic Park was marketed and sold as luxury living, the best that money could buy. People flocked to pay thousands, even millions of dollars to invest into the dream. Now the, the jewel, if I could say, of Sydney Olympic Park was Opal Tower. And it was set to be the best residential tower in Olympic Park. And, and we were told one of the best in Sydney. When you first walked into that building, when you've seen your apartment finished, were you happy? We were very excited about it. It looked beautiful. It's a luxury construction, luxury building. So this was the dream, wasn't it? This is what we were buying into, the, the Australian dream. And how did it turn out? Well, unfortunately, this has probably been the hardest thing that owners of this tower have gone through in their lives. Shady Iskander and Andy Neverly are two of the many owners now looking up at this building, wondering how it could all go so wrong. There's 392 apartments here. Each family, each owner, each resident has been affected because these are the events of Christmas Eve. Yeah. Everyone has their own story, which is heartbreaking. Police marched into the building with battering rams. Santa didn't come to the Opal Tower last Christmas Eve. I can't go back home. I've got all my stuff inside. Chaos and fear beat him to it after a loud cracking sound reverberated through the building, sparking a mass evacuation. Or something snapped in the building and the doors got jammed, the police had to break them up. I got a call from my wife and she was heading home before I was and she said, Shady, uh, the, the streets are all blocked off. Um, I, I, I can't get to the building. There are police and emergency services everywhere. Everyone's moved out. Emergency services are there. Train line is stopped. Everyone's evacuated from the area. You know, it, the, the building was emptied uh, with the threat of it maybe falling over. Tell me about your thought You're at that time. You're joking. I mean, we were so up, we were, we were gobsmacked, absolutely gobsmacked. Something was seriously wrong with a building that had only been opened four months earlier. The cracking first occurred in concrete panels of what's called a sky garden on the 10th floor. It was caught on the CCTV cameras. The tower was moving, so its developer, Eco, commenced emergency stabilising works, propping up ceilings and reinforcing walls to prevent further damage. 60 Minutes is the first media crew into this area. So this is ground zero at Opal Tower where the cracking occurred on the 10th floor, right along this wall. It has been covered up as part of the remediation work in this area. Now, the residents, of course, are concerned until they're confident that this has generally shored up the building. They don't want to move back in. So what's this here? So these are uh, major industrial acro props. There are 900 of these. 900? 900 located through the building up to level 10. So level you're 10. saying people have got these in these, their apartments? They're in the living rooms, they're in the bedrooms, they're going all the way up to level 10. So it's expected that we move in with these uh, still installed. Does, it, does this look safe to you? But people have got these in their apartments. That's right, major industrial props. These props can hold between 60 and 100 tonnes each. And although the residents have been promised the building won't collapse, most have voted with their feet and have vacated the tower. This was the dream. Unit 2208. Correct. What did you pay? $840,000 plus uh, stamp duty. Let's have a look. Of around 37000 
Come in. Andy Neverly put his life savings into this apartment. Wow, look at this view. Yeah, it, it is impressive. His tenants are now gone and they're not coming back. You couldn't There's... imagine that something like this could end up going so badly wrong. Well, that's right. It's uh, our worst nightmare. It's uh, what you call the Australian, Australian dream turned into the Australian nightmare. What do you reckon you'd sell it for now? I don't think it's worth anything. Seriously? Would, would, you, buy, would you buy into it? What does that mean for your life savings? Well, it's lost. It's gone. It's evaporated. We're up shit creek. It's not a good creek to be up. Well, especially without a paddle, yeah. Right now, every owner in the Opal Tower thinks they're up the same creek. And while this is an extreme case, around the country, there's a huge and growing number of property owners who might be in exactly the same position as housing prices slump. The debt bomb is already too big. The fuse is running. The banks, frankly, just lent and lent and lent on the assumption that home prices will always go up. Martin North is a banking and housing analyst, and his straight talk courts controversy. But he's unrepentant about his gloomy predictions for our housing market. Martin, the last time you spoke with 60 Minutes, you predicted in a worst case scenario that property prices across Australia could fall by as much as 40%. Looking back, do you think that was extreme? No. Um, international issues um, flowing in over the top of what's happening locally, uh, I still think that we could see 40% plus falls over two or three years. You know, it's not going to happen overnight. 20 to 30% is my best guess for a local crisis without of that international context, which would take us even into more negative territory. While housing prices fall, mortgages don't. And that's a problem for more than four and a half million households with a home loan. So these darker areas are where the highest number of people with negative equity live. OK, so negative equity, let's explain, is if these people in the dark blue areas in particular had to sell tomorrow, they would get less for their house than what they owe to the bank. Yeah, you'd still owe the bank if you tried to sell. And that's a big deal. More and more Australian households are now sliding into negative equity, particularly in Sydney and Melbourne, where real estate has already slumped by as much as 20%. What numbers of households are we talking about with this negative equity? OK, nationally, it's 450,000 households. Well, well, right? 450,000 households. Out of about the 4.75 million who have some sort of property mortgage. So close on 10%, one in 10 people. Correct. If they sold their house, would not have enough money to repay their mortgage. They have no way out. They're mortgage prisoners. They're prisoners in their property. It was overwhelming. It was getting to a place of, it was just going down. Trapped? Were you trapped? Yeah, I, f I felt trapped, yeah. Ellie Sapper confronted the negative equity nightmare a couple of years after purchasing her first home in the Melbourne suburb of Carnegie. What did you pay for the property? I paid 600,000. And how much of that 600,000 did you put in yourself? Um, I put in 140,000. I put in a 20% deposit. So $460,000 is the debt you took on? That's correct. So, Ross, if you look up over there, um, that's my, the third, the third balcony, that was my, yeah, okay. that was my home. Wow. When you moved in, what were you feeling? Excited, it felt mine, it was like, it, it just, it felt secure. But this feeling of security didn't last long. Last year, as the bills mounted, Ellie came to the painful realisation she would have to sell. But then, the pain got worse and I approached a number of real estate agents and they said to me, just quite straightforwardly, we can't put your property up for more than 450,000. But hang on, you paid 600,000. Exactly. And they wanted to say that they could sell it for 450,000. Yeah. $150,000 loss. Yeah. That would have wiped out everything that you put into their property. Everything that I put in. Ellie managed to avoid her negative equity crisis when real estate agent Dion Besser sold her property for $550,000. Yeah, I'm glad that I could help. Still a loss, but by no means a disaster. So you've come back here. What are your emotions looking at it now? Well, it's sad and 
it's a, it's a loss. I've got to accept the loss, but it's, it's not home anymore. Ellie's problems would have been compounded many times over if her apartment had proven to be defective, like the Opal Tower. But don't imagine that whatever the problems are in this tower, that it's an isolated case. Is Opal the only one with issues? No, I think you'll find that there's a large number of projects where there are major defects occurring. And so, so how many buildings are we talking about? Oh, you're talking about thousands. And uh, thousands? My gravest fear is that there will be fatalities because of defects in buildings, and the most likely area of fatalities is in fire safety. Former New South Wales Treasury Secretary Michael Lambert was asked to review building standards after this horrific fire in Bankstown in 2012, when two Chinese students were forced to jump for their lives. We do have one deceased female, and we have another female patient who's been transported to Liverpool Hospital. Non-compliant alterations had turned their building into a fire trap. But despite Michael Lambert's calls for sweeping reform, nothing has changed. So how many recommendations did you make to the state government? I made 150 recommendations uh, covering 10 major areas of reform. And at this stage, virtually none of them have been acted upon. So in other words, the conditions hmm. that caused the young woman to jump off the Bankstown building has not necessarily been changed by the government since your report? Unfortunately, that is the case, yes. Very unfortunately. Does it worry you that you see so many cranes, so many buildings on apartment blocks going up right now across Sydney, across Australia? Of course, because fundamentally, with, with this booming in construction, people are trying to get projects on the market very quickly. And there's a high risk that they're cutting corners. So if you were a potential buyer, Martin, do you reckon you'd buy into the Opal Tower? No. I wouldn't actually buy in one of the new high-rise because I think there are too many risks on the price, on the quality of construction, and other factors too. But this is a symbol of something much broader, that we have so many properties across Australia which are being thrown up or have been thrown up with significant defects in them. I think we've built a generation of properties that frankly could become slums in 20 or 30 years. And that's a very significant issue, not just for those individuals, but for the broader economy. So this is apartment 1005. It was completed, a luxury apartment. In fact, I'm walking through where the bathroom was right now. And of course, these are the walls that need to be stabilised. The big question is, for the resident, well, I can't live here now, but would they be confident enough to live here in the future? There is no doubt that people are going to suffer extreme financial loss, extreme financial hardship because of this. Now we've had a, a real estate agent who is actually um, on our committee and uh, he had an apartment that was up for sale prior to the events of Christmas Eve. Um, and I think it was up for sale at approximately say $800,000. Um, he received an offer following the events of Christmas Eve for an offer around $400,000. Now- Half price. Half price, but not only that Ross, the same person then said, you know what? As the story continued to unfold, mate, I'm not even going to even offer you a dollar. I tell you, you've got more rights buying a toaster, more consumer rights buying a toaster than you do buying a unit. But a toaster's worth 80 bucks. Yeah. An apartment's worth 80 840,000. Yeah, that's right. Well, you tell me, explain that to me. I don't know. Hello, I'm Liz Hayes. Thanks for watching. To keep up with the latest from 60 Minutes Australia, make sure you subscribe to our channel. You can also download the Nine Now app for full episodes and other exclusive 60 Minutes content.